Namaskara, hello, and welcome to the 2020 edition of the Bengaluru Poetry Festival. I'm Shikha Malvia, and today we are thrilled to bring you three of the most skilled and talented South Asian diaspora poets here in the United States. Rena Shirali, Subhashni Kaligotla, and Kiran Kapoor. All three of them will be sharing their poems with us today and offering some insights into their work. The theme, interpreted loosely, is poetry as refuge, ritual, and representation. The world has changed these past few months, and many of us are seeking shelter in poetry. We're nurturing ourselves with the tangible, but also trying to understand the intangible. Poet and scholar Mina Alexander talked about a poetics of dislocation, a migrant poetics that cuts across multiple geographies, languages, and ethnicities a poetics which swings between the trauma of being uprooted and the excitement of planting new seeds and a vibrant pulsing poetics, which is like a palimpsest where the past comes shining through present experience. But now perhaps another type of dislocation has occurred as we are forced to stay in one place and yet here we are going global across digital lines. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us, Rana, Subhashni and Kiran. So um, let's start with the poems of Rana. Rana Shirali is the author of Guilt from Yes Yes Books, which won the 2018 Milt Kessler Poetry Book Award. She is the winner of a Pushcart Prize and a former Philip Roth resident at Bucknell University. Rana is also the recipient of prizes and honors from Vida, Gulf Coast, Boston Review, and Cosmonauts Avenue. Her poems and reviews have appeared widely in American Poetry Review, The Nation, and elsewhere. Rana lives in Philadelphia, where she recently co-organized co We Too Are Philly, a summer poetry festival highlighting voices of color. She is assistant professor of English at Holy Family University and co-editor-in-chief of Muzzle Magazine. Welcome, Rana. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here, sharing space with all of you. Um, I'm just going to say a couple uh, pieces of context about the work I'm about to read to you, just um, two longer pieces. So the manuscript from which I'm reading today engages with the topic of the ongoing process of witch hunting in India. Um, I have been researching into uh, its iteration in Jakun specifically, so any language that you hear around witch hunting um, is coming from that region herein. Um, you will hear the word dions, which refers to women who are accused of being witches. Um, and this first poem I'm going to open with, I wrote, uh, I know it's a little meta, about writing poems about <laughs> this topic, um, which, you know, takes place in, uh, in Jakarta. I've not visited in a long time. I'm currently very isolated to Philadelphia, right? So thinking about the, um, my existence in a Western context and uh, calling out to the subject uh, across oceans. The topic of this first one. At first, trying to reach those accused. I swallowed burnt matchsticks, her hair a tar tumbleweed in the room's south-facing corner. I did this to pray, and I did this to feel. And then I swallowed my old chant, his name, his name, like I'm not made of my oppressor's undoing. And then I swallowed theory. I swallowed plantation politics, tried prying plantains from my lips, plump from sitting on a velvet couch and touching them, dry to my wrists, while reading about her body, strung up for slaughter, called names in the oppressor's language, covered in silt. And then I swallowed puddles, and then I swallowed sandalwood and tried to cloak and cover and render her erotic, for the oppressor sometimes saves the objects of his desire. And then I swallowed desire. I held the smoldering cow dung patty at my core. I smelled like it. I was shit and wanted to be shit. And then I swallowed pretense, swallowed countries. Why try to get close when you could become, I said. And then I swallowed myself, chased me down with goat milk and shorn fur. And then I turned to the page and swallowed it. And I took it like a shot and took it like a man and took the punches and still wandered through mazes of huts, asking my people what it felt like to be oppressed. 
and then I swallowed tea. I swallowed the fertilized soil, and then I swallowed braids and locust shells, and I wanted to smell like incense because the oppressor values patchouli and cedar, so I bought a candle to smell like my heritage, and then I swallowed wax and was viscous, and suddenly, then, I could not move. And my ankles were bound, but they left my wrists free. And I could not speak, but still I mouthed a name I'd never heard, and I felt her like my own ghost. There was no magic. It was not profound. Fabulous. I'm so glad to be able to see your faces while doing this. I <laughs> <So> agree. <laughs> Uh, just one more piece, actually. So uh, this poem is uh, written after Kathy Lynn Che's poem entitled Los Angeles, Manila, Danang. Um, I was inspired by this notion of the poem as existing across three places, um, in particular as a you know child of immigrants myself, existing across places <laughs> resonated. I'm sure it resonates with lots of us here. Um, yeah, I think that's all the context you need. Jodhpur, Jharkhand, Philadelphia. The air is writ of ash and sand, though this is no memorial. Camels buckle clumsily groundward, and I've forgotten how to grieve. I was nowhere when my grandparents died, just like I'm nowhere now picturing Jain temples and carved elephants and the faces of so many monkeys huddled on eaves. I wish all women on earth a day of invisible. I wish for no trials, no catcalls, no sound. Like how I am on this dune, transparent, wondering about power and numbers. Bodies of accused dions go unreported while I roast dough over dull heat. This in the country empire left behind. Here the flower silted air. Here the warm dry scent of pyre. I'm moving now through paved streets, all old film detergent, kept aloft by gusts from subway grates, wondering how the river smells when women are dragged into it, the pink city turning blue at dusk, sandstone falling into music. At a wedding in the West, my great aunt celebrates her sister's death. Spirits, she sings, are all around us, good and evil, and will we lend an open ear? Here is my plea on cue, country of drought and several gods, country of waterfalls wrung brown with soil's unease. I'm not there enough, not you enough, and I've come to ask what to do with our dead, river mouth and useless, reading up on reportage. I'm by a stream or in the desert or dragging my scent through the unwashed city. What good is brotherly love? What good is empire paving over ground bones. I don't know why this story matters. I don't know why this story. Wow, that was Thank beautiful. You. Wonderful. So powerful and so visceral as well. Um, thank you so much. Um, so next, we have Subhashni Kalibotla, who is a poet and architectural historian in medieval India. She's been a Kundaman Fellow and is author of Bird of the Indian Subcontinent from the Great Indian Poetry Collective. And her poems have appeared or are forthcoming in the Caravan, New England Review, the Literary Review, the Paris Review, and elsewhere. She's assistant professor in the Department of Art History at Yale University. Welcome, Sebastian. Thank you so much, Shika. Uh, and uh, thank you for organizing this reading. It's so exciting, really, to be reading with uh, Kiran and Rana and to be in conversation with all of you. It's also really meaningful to participate in the Bengaluru Poetry Festival, especially during these precarious times when we need poetry more than ever. Um, and Bangalore is also the place where my first poetry book debuted at the city's own Atta Galata bookstore. So this is, this is doubly exciting for me. So I'll uh, read a couple of poems from my first book of poems, Bird of the Indian Subcontinent. Uh, thank you, Shikha, for bringing out this book. 
Um, and as the title suggests, the Indian subcontinent, the places, people, and cultures of the Indian subcontinent are really important to this book, as are many other places and cultures. Uh, but today I'll be focusing on the, the subcontinental aspects. Um, one particular city has been especially important to me, uh, and this is the city of Hyderabad, which I consider my home in India. This is the place from which I've launched my explorations of India, particularly the architecture of medieval India. How sly the heart. Send an innocuous little text, she whispered. Make it short and flirty. No strings, no needs, no plangency. Just a thinking of you in Hyderabad sort of thing. I was tempted, sitting across from mother as I was, cut off from male company, except for the telephone men who wander through the house in their hapless way, while we, mother and I, devour hundreds of pages with our tea and swallow fistfuls of warm air with our bread and watch the honey eaters sting the red throats of the hibiscus. This is the best time. Flocks of birds pass overhead. The heat subsides. Now is the best time. Scrawny-necked cormorants <laughs> move in large crowds with quick wing beats. Egrets are slow and stately, intimate in groups of twos and threes. And the parakeets race like teenage boys. But before you can find their sound, a noise between harsh and kind, they've gone. If equanimity should find me, it'll find me at this place, at this hour, between six and seven, when the wanting stops and I'm happy to sit and watch and have exactly what's laid out for me. Beautiful. Thank you. I'm going to read uh, two more short poems from this, uh, from this book. And these poems are written from the point of view of Sita, who's the female protagonist of the epic Ramayana. As many of us know here, Sita has a, a tragic arc, a tragic story in the, the context of the traditional Ramayanas. And I've been fascinated by her story as well as the stories of the other women in the Ramayana. And so I'm really glad to be following uh, Rana's uh, poems and those powerful poems, which are told from the point of view of, of women's uh, interiority and women's experience, particularly uh, the demon women of the Ramayana, like Shurpanaka and Kaikeyi, uh, uh, have, have, are fascinating. These two poems are, again, from the point of view of, of Sita. My heart belongs to daddy. When Ravan drove down from Lanka, I climbed in, tossing my chokers along the way, the baubles, bracelets, and bangles, so that casuarinas assumed the aspect and glamour of Christmas trees. What I want, what I want, is to stay on this teardrop island, coddled by recalcitrant seas and jungles prowled by red-eyed langurs. I'm his woman now. Refusing Rama. My favorite, one of my favorites. <laughs> Very short, um, refusing Rama. Mother gave, sorry, let's start again. Mother gave birth to a crop of root vegetables. Like a clay pot, she swelled, leaking me to him who tilled the land with blood and everything of mine. Mother, quick, sew me back. My husband is calling. Beautiful. I just have to say that, you know, that strong voice of I, you know, I mean, in your poetry, there's such a strong voice that, you know, takes agency, right? And that um, speaks forth. And I think that's something that's often missing in the poems that we read. And so 
I love how beautifully this is coming together and you know, there's Rena's um, dying poems and your um, poems as well. Like there's such a beautiful, powerful thread that's being woven on its own organically. And yes, yes, I'm, I'm really pleased that, uh, at, at how this conversation is shaping up. Uh, so I would like to read two poems from my second collection. Do I have time or um, should we uh, just read one more because okay yeah. okay I'll, I'll read one more and um, I will just read another poem that is in dialogue with the Ramayana um, and I think in a sense it uh, it will pair well with the Rana's poems and uh, in the second book of poems which is all elegies I'm more interested in sound and music and so what I'm interested in the Rama what I draw from the Ramayana is the repetitions, the metaphors, the, 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 the kind of music of the Ramayana. Relic. My sweetheart brought me a scarf, velvet soft, blue like peacock. My sweetheart brought me a scarf, voice soft, blue like the cosmos. My sweetheart's scarf lapped my neck. My sweetheart's scent licked my nape. My sweetheart's scarf bristled, blue, blue like the cosmos, blue like the bruised veil of K. My sweetheart's scarf voyaged, bristling with the gem of breath and the coin of touch. My sweetheart's scarf, soft as his voice when he called me sweet, hard, blue like peacock, blue like the cosmos, blue like the bruised veil of K, bristles with the bone of mind, the pearl of heart, and the ash of love. My sweetheart's scarf bristles with beauty. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Subhashini. Um, and now I'm really excited to have Kiran Kapoor read her work, whose second collection, Women in the Waiting Room, was a finalist for the National Poetry Series and is forthcoming from Black Lawrence Press this year. And uh, Kiran was the winner of the Arts and Letters Rumi Prize in Poetry and the Anti-Venom Poetry Award for her first book, Visiting Indira Gandhi's Palmist from Elixir Press. Her work has appeared in Agni, Poetry International, Prairie Schooner, and many other journals. Kiran serves as poetry editor at the Drum Literary Magazine and currently teaches at Amherst College. Thank you, Kiran, for being here. Welcome. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here and to read with all of you um, and to just have uh, that sort of wonderful contradictory experience of our isolation allowing us to be together in a way that we wouldn't necessarily possibly be um, under normal circumstances. So thank you so much to the festival and to you, Shika, for having me. Um, I um, love Mina's idea of the poetry of dislocation, um, and I picked a few poems today um, in response to that. Um, although while I was hearing these other beautiful readings, I was thinking of other poems and started sort of digging around um, uh, to find some other ones. But um, uh, I, I'll read a few that just are, are connected to that idea of dislocation and multiple geographies and languages, um, and also to the sense of trauma um, being connected to the renewal and refuge that it can provide for us. Um, this first poem, um, is about uh, being dead um, and also about being American. Um, it's called From the Afterlife. I wanted to be a bone, white, hard, when vain and wish still able to rattle the essential notes. But no music gets made when you pit yourself against ideas of yourself. Dust suits me better. Gray, brown, fleck. I can mix. Move into the smallest space. Spark the biggest tunes. Divide me into 50 states. Winsome, wondering, crazed. My face scattered by teaspoon. Over the great basin of plucked out mines. And salt rising in a haze. Over hard farmed heartland. The bent fair headed wheat the combine's cloud, silt along the fat lip of a riverbed, semis hissing and grumbling in tongues. I can still feel the hum of the telephone wires running from one life to another. I filled those lines 
in case a story is a body, in case we lose our place. Hello, friend, I can touch everything, but can't stop thinking. Turns out, thoughts granulate. Turns out, I never was a girl. I was all those girls, a girl statue, torch raised, you know the one, standing in the harbor, wearing a sari. The tide foams up. Now I'm so much dust, I'm a continent, absorbing, a thimble full of mother, angry powder, laughing specks, froth, filth, lover, crying cinders, particles of mineral wind. I'm proof that nothing is lost. You can breathe me in. Um, my first book was very much about my family, um, which, which my, my parents came from different corners of the world. Um, and both of them um, came out of histories um, with a lot of trauma in them. Um, in my dad's case, a, a historical trauma um, of partition. Um, and in my mom's uh, case, much more private, more mundane um, traumas. But in the process of writing those poems, I think I came very much to be reminded of the way that language provides us refuge um, and renewal and becomes sort of the receptacle by which we can survive. Um, so this poem takes its title from that idea. It's called For the Survivors. Begin with the seed. Begin with the father and the mother, your first Adam and Eve. Begin with what falls from the tree. You can live on bruised and sweet. Begin with a monsoon breeze, begin with a flood. Begin with the miles of silk and mud and the wings of cranes and the stilt-like legs of a house with no one left inside. With a young wife burying her sons and books riding the tide until they're caught and their philosophies dried out on laundry lines. Begin with a pen, begin with a cage, begin with the memory of what they said while you tried to turn your face away. Begin with bargains, with stains, the names of towns built over towns, built over graves. Begin with your life burned down, with a God who hasn't been seen since the burning bush, or the goddess who steps into the flames like a housewife into a dress, or a fairy tale of hair so long that love climbed up. Begin by putting your mouth to the mouth of your dreams. Begin with tendons, teeth, with what never goes away, a highway pricked by gravel and stars, low beams on wind and trucks and emptiness. Begin, it starts with being, ends like a ringing bell. Begin, begin, ring yourself. So powerful, oh my God. Um, this last poem is from um, my new book, which is coming out in October, and I'm excited about it. Um, and uh, it started, I think it very much um, speaks to this idea of the way that geographies come together in, um, in diasporic communities um, and, in, and in poetry in general. Um, it was inspired by um, my reading of ancient Greek poetry and by the way that um, ancient Greek authors often begin their work with invocations. They, they bring into being through language the presence of, of a god. Um, and as I thought about that idea and worked on that idea, of course, my own gods and goddesses entered the poem um, and my own geographies um, worked upon it. It's called, I Ride Upon a Tiger. I ride upon a tiger. My bones are made of whales. And when whales die, they're songs. My eyes are pits of mangoes, scraped clean by teeth. From my feet plunge 50 streams. The rush, the cold, exposes underworlds of fear. Four stomachs cannot explain my hungers. I have devoured myself. I tread upon my loves. Strung with a necklace of hummingbirds, my hair in braids, my braids are tongues. Atop my head, a crown of languages, 40 spoken all at once. My breastplates gleam and hum, two armies marching on. You, 
who extract the marrow and the light, you who suck the sun and leave the bone eroded colder, demon, disease, dear faded one, do you hear? I will come to you on the back of a tiger. That is, oh my God, that imagery is fantastic. Um, and um, so I guess um, we're all done reading and sharing, right? Um, thank you, thank you so much. Um, such beautiful moving words that I'm sure everyone who sees this is gonna be taking this back with them and holding these words for a long time. Um, and um, I'm so inspired uh, also. I'm, I'm so lucky to have all of you three here in this room. <laughs> I wanted to come back to what um, I mentioned above, Mina Alexander's Poetics of Dislocation. I feel that such a poetics makes for poems that are multitasking. And I think we see that in all of your poems. You're not doing one thing. I mean, several things are happening, right? And, and you're drawing from history and myths, weaving in the present, tackling issues of identity, race, culture, spirituality. And also all of this is happening in our world, which is so fast paced. So. My question to all of you in this regard is, what does it mean to be a poet of the, of the diaspora, to be a South Asian poet? And what is the function of poetry for all of you? Who do you write for? And um, do you feel the certain sense of responsibility that you need to represent the cultures and community you come from or to educate other communities about you know, your own background or your own beliefs? Or is it a combination? You know, so, I love you guys to your thoughts on it. Rena, you want to go first because no. you, you read. <laughs> I went first last time. <laughs> it's um, now. I, I, I think that there's so many questions there that um, it's difficult to tackle all of those. So I'll just tackle one of them. This this idea of do you feel a sense of responsibility to represent your culture for other cultures or to translate, maybe that's, that's, the, that's the, 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 the question that's underlying what you're saying. Um, I, I don't know if I, I do feel that. Um, maybe I did, uh, it, you know, when I was younger, maybe in my MFA days, uh, the, the, there, was that, <laughs> there was that pressure. And also those were different times because um, I did my MFA in the early 2000s and it seemed like, um, you know, in, the, in, in the, the kind of training we received, the poets we read were all from the Anglo-American tradition or maybe we read European poets in translation. So there was a less an interest or a knowledge of South Asia. I mean, that, that is changing now. So I'd like to think of myself more as straddling multiple literary universes and multiple geographies and spaces. Um, and that in a sense, maybe my, my work can bridge or um, bridge these uh, different literary universes and artistic universes. And even also that, that, that we can bridge different ways of thinking and different ways of writing. So I'm thinking for instance, South Asian poetry again, uh, across, the, uh, across time periods and Anglo-American poetry, like maybe my work can bridge those two domains. Maybe my work can bridge art history and poetry, you know, scholarship and, and literary writing. Um, you mentioned history, so history and poetry, um, the, the past and, and the present. So if, if I can, yeah, if I can do that, I think um, that, that would be great. Um, and, and, and through, I suppose through craft and through lyricism and through uh, an attention to um, aesthetic principles rather than any kind of conscious way of uh, a conscious move to, to translate. Right. And Kiran, what about you? <laughs> um, I too um, feel this is a question that has changed very much for me over time. Um, I think if you'd asked my young self about it, I would have said, oh, no, of course I don't, I'm not representing anything. Um, and then in, in, you know, as I went also to school, I discovered that whether I liked it or not, I was representing things. Yeah. Um, and that that was an unpleasant discovery for me. Um, and I can, I have a very distinct memory of writing a poem um, about my family. And afterwards, a classmate saying to me, oh, your poems are so political. 
Um, mm -hmm. They're all about identity. And I, I really hadn't thought of it that way. Um, um, and I think it's because the baseline, of course, that everyone is comparing it against is a, is a white identity. Um, and therefore, just by being yourself, you take on these issues, these responsibilities of representation, um, which I you know, have very mixed feelings about. I sometimes bridle against them. Um, and yet, of course, I, I do believe very much in, in a kind of collective action that helps make the world better for, for writers of color and for people of color in general. Um, and so even though I don't set out to represent anything, um, I'm aware that I, I have to um, in some ways and that I take that very seriously because I want to make the world better for, for people like me and for, for all people, really. I think we all benefit when um, voices of color are um, take their rightful places. Um, very much, I think my teaching is about that. I'd like my students to have a very different experience than I had as a student. Um, and that has to do often with representation and being, um, being a South Asian woman in the classroom. Um, so, uh, so I guess in some ways, I feel like that question was, or that, that responsibility was given to me from the outside. It didn't mm -hmm. come from the inside really. Um, and yet I find myself tackling it um, in a lot of contexts. Um, I think for me in general, um, to move on to some other po parts of that question, um, you know, I think I, I come to poetry because it accommodates, um, it's one of the few forms of speech that doesn't seek to homogenize um, or insist on consistency or consensus. Um, it's capable of honoring and reflecting sort of conflict and ambiguity and contradiction, um, which is very much how I experience the world, I think. Um, and I, I love it for its ability to allow unsolvable problems or realities or identities to thrive. Um, and that's, I think, what draws me, that, that splendid multiplicity, which is possible in poems, um, is what draws me to them. It, you, you put that so beautifully. And um, if, when you mention, um, like, you know, it is... I guess in a way is poetry, um, is writing poetry a political act? Um, I couldn't help but think of Audre Lorde and Adrienne Rich, who both say that, I think in their own way, that if you are a woman and if you are writing, it is a political act because the voices of women have been suppressed for so long. And, you know, to be a woman of color, I think that, you know, that makes it even more insistent, even more important. And, um, so I'm really glad, um, you know, you brought that up. And uh, Rena, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on all of it. I mean, both, thank you both for <laughs> such uh, really moving and well-articulated responses to those questions. Um, I'm finding that I'm less drawn to say anything that I had written in preparation and more to respond, uh, you know, in conversation with uh, the points you both bring up. Um, and thank you, Sheikha, for bringing up Audrey and Rich as well. I, I was thinking about her quote from the poem from An Old House in America, uh, the line, any woman's death diminishes me. Mm -hmm. um, it's just one that like ricochets around in my skull very often. And um, I think it's related to you know, what you're pointing out um, regarding projected responsibility versus like internal sense of responsibility. And I think you know, being um, reconciling with the fact that the projected responsibilities from others, you know, from a white audience, from a white professor, from white readership onto us as people of color is to fit molds, right? And to um, meet expectations about portrayals of otherness, whether that's telling a particular trauma narrative, right? Which itself is becoming more and more complicated now as, uh, you know, the trauma narratives of people of color are now being commodified and asked for, right, and valued over other kinds of narratives. So I do think it's important to hold ourselves to a sort of internal compass on that front. Like, if what's expected of me in a given place, place performance or otherwise, right, is to adhere to a particular notion of South Asian-ness or, or asian Americanness more broadly, then it's, imp it's all the more important to present work that is multimodal, right? Um, includes aesthetic approaches that would not necessarily be expect expected of, right? <laughs> An Asian American mm -hmm. writer um, include content that is not necessarily expected of the venue, right? I think in particular when we're in predominantly white spaces, it's important to do that. Lovely to not be in that space right now. <laughs> so <laughs> very freeing and liberating. Um, but I was, I will close with, I was in a, 
conversation this week with a couple other Asian American authors who were talking about um, how even the label Asian American or even South Asian is like, it's such a, a universalizing and homogenizing label and it utterly erases the differences that we have among us, right? Like I'm uh, Gujarati and Konkani, but like that's not how my, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. poetry introduction ever frames my identity. So I do think that coming to our work with a sort of sense of um, always telling the story in as complicated and visceral of a way as we can, right? As such that that's true to our experiences, helps to build a better, um, better but maybe not ideal, right? Um, more kaleidoscopic, more nuanced understanding of what being Asian is, <laughs> being South Asian is, so. That's, I mean, I. I all of you have put it so beautifully. And the thing is, I, I feel like we're seeing a shift in literature. Like you don't see things being explained the way they used to explain. Like, you know, and she wore a dupatta, which is blah, blah, yard of, you know, fabric and draped across her. You know, you don't see stuff like that anymore. You're not even seeing glossaries anymore or, you know, words that are um, italicized anymore. You know, you're, people are using, um, you know, la languages like Hindi and Gujarati and, you know, they're sprinkling it into their work. And, um, you know, I think it's really beautiful how we don't feel we need to explain ourselves. I mean, and now with um, the internet, hey, you don't know what, you know, this means, go look it up, right? Um, we're actually compelling other people to do some labor in order to understand yeah. our culture rather than us having to do more labor than necessary to have them understand where we're coming from. So I, I think things are changing and it's thanks to writers like you uh, uh, that, you know, this is happening and the next generation will, will be really happy. I mean, and they have other problems they really need to be working on too. So I'm glad that, you know, this is something that we can all, you know, give back you know we can we can like break the, all these barriers i don't know I mean, if, if i'm making sense but so this has been such an illuminating reading and conversation and i want to thank all of you and good luck with all of your new um upcoming books and um thank you thank you so much thank you so much <laughs> thank you.